The Senate passed legislation this past week to help protect teens who are the victims of bullying in person and online. I spoke with Senator Len Susio about tackling this heartbreaking issue. So there is movement this session on issues regarding bullying um, and ways to protect uh, our kids from bullying and cyberbullying. Tell me about some of those efforts. Yes. Uh, well, the bill that was uh, voted on by the Senate today addresses not only bullying in general, but cyberbullying as well. And it also has a clause in it regarding suicide and uh, dealing with situations when that's occurred. Uh, I had particularly personal experience with this when in my school district where I was on the Board of Ed back about nine or ten years ago. One of our middle school students who was only 12 years old at the time took his own life. And uh, that really affected the entire community, obviously his own family as well. It was really tragic and uh, we're still reeling from it to some extent. Right, and that was the case of, of a little 12-year-old boy who um, committed suicide in his closet at home. It was a terrifying and horrifying situation. I sat in on the court case. Um, and, and that, you're saying, motivated you. Talk about the ways that these, uh, this bill will, will help um, to hopefully prevent that kind of thing. Well, obviously we want to prevent suicides from happening, not just react to them, and the bill addresses that. It requires training of all school personnel who have direct or indirect contact with students. So it will not only be teachers, it will also be uh, administrators and, and people who are on the school grounds that would nor ordinarily come in contact with uh, children and students. And it helps them, number one, to recognize a bullying situation, and number two, know what to do about it. Sometimes in life, you know, you see something that's shocking to you, and you don't know how to respond to it, and so you more or less let it pass by. Well, this bill tries to address that so that when, when a school personnel see something like this going on, they'll be more than passive, they'll be proactive and, and intervene. And it's interesting that it does include not only teachers, but uh, all kinds of people who come into contact with the kids throughout the school day. Oh, yes. I mean, in the typical school, uh, the teacher is only one of probably a dozen other school personnel that they come in contact with in any given school day. So it was important not just to restrict it to teachers themselves, but other, other people, the janitors, and people, again, who would be in the proximity of the students at any time during the day. And talk about particularly the um, cyberbullying component, because that's something that we're hearing more about in this day and age, and, and, and what you did about that. Right. Well, actually, you know, I mean, when I went to school, there wasn't even the Internet or even computers, so uh, I'm learning a lot myself. Uh, and cyberbullying is something that's just a, a new phenomenon that's just evolved very rapidly only in the last few years. We had public testimony on it back a few months ago when the bill was proceeding through the committees, and a lot of that testimony was very, very uh, emotional and touching. Um, I, again, had never heard of cyberbullying, but it's becoming apparently much more widespread. We heard not only from adults, we heard from uh, kids themselves, students themselves. And um, there was another component that you talked about, about uh, teen su addressing teen suicide? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. There was another component of this bill addressing specifically teen suicide? or? Oh, yes. There's a, there's a specific uh, section of the bill that addresses when suicides occur and, and how to work with kids who have uh, been traumatized by something like that. And uh, tell me more about that. What It works with um, families or with... Uh, who does it work? Well, it's, it's focused on the school community yeah. itself. You know, So it would be personnel and students that go to the individual schools. We recognize the school itself as, as, as its own community yeah. of children and adults. So tell me, I mean, is it difficult in this kind of a budget situation, we are, we're obviously in a tough budget year, to um, get things like this passed, which do um, require some uh, fiscal component? Yeah, uh, there, there is a, a, a bit of a burden on, uh, a little bit on the state. The State Department of Education has created a training program. So the cost is very, very minimal for the state. Uh, but again, uh, the cities and towns are required to train personnel, and there will be some costs associated with that. Uh, I would have liked to have seen something that would have alleviated that somewhat and made the training biannual as opposed to annual, uh, but uh, in discussing it among uh, some of the senators, there didn't seem to be support for it. It might be amended in the House, however. I think that would be a good move. It would alleviate the pressure on, uh, in my district, there's like 500 uh, personnel who are non-certified, non-teaching personnel that would be, in effect, subject to training every year at $30 an hour. That's $15,000 worth of costs every year. And I think a biannual training would be more than adequate. So, I mean, there is other work getting done here in this session. I mean, we're hearing, of course, a lot about the budget and the, and the deal that the governor's administration made with the union, but um, you all are, are working on other things. Oh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, well, the thing that surprised me, though, is uh, there's you know, given the fiscal crisis we're in, uh, there's still a lot of bills in, in there that have spending, new spending on them, and that concerns me quite a bit. Even this morning when we were talking about the uh, Yukon Health Center, uh, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars, and uh, 
I'm from the financial world. I'm from banking, finance, and accounting. I want to see the numbers. I want to see in-depth projections so that we can exercise our responsibility to protect taxpayers against squandering their resources. I mean, tax dollars are precious, and we're overtaxed already. I don't want to take on another multi-million dollar boondoggle. I mean, do you think you're going to get adequate um, access to those numbers before you guys have to vote on something? Well, uh, in the hearing this morning, Secretary Barnes uh, promised me that he would get me those numbers. He, he says that they've been done. I take him at his word. He's a good man. He's a professional. And uh, as a professional that he is, he should have done them. I'm certain he will afford them to me. And you can rest assured I'll be reading them at midnight. Right. Um, but uh, you do have concerns. I mean, kind of a mixed message, you think, in terms of we're talking about uh, the governor is talking about shared sacrifice and, and towing the line, and, right. and yet you see a lot of spending in these bills? Yeah, there's still spending going on in, in spite of the fact that we are under, you know, underwater financially in the state. I just think the governor talks about uh, the state's open for business. I think it's time that the state act like a business and start doing what we do in the banking and financial world. When big spending is presented in front of you, you examine it closely and in great detail before you approve it. And all too often, um, big dollars are thrown around here with very superficial details. And I think if we're going to act responsibly, protect the taxpayers, and do what's best for Connecticut, we, ha we need to demand a lot more in-depth uh, presentation. Is there going to be a special session, you think? Uh, I'm a novice up here. Uh, my gut is there may very well be, because I suspect, I mean, right now, even, first of all, CBAC hasn't been approved yet, and the, the legislature is supposed to approve it. And even if it were approved, there's explicitly a $400 million shortfall in the budget, which we, with some other plan has to be presented. And within the CBAC agreement, honestly, there's $600 million of pure fantasy savings that don't even exist. They're just numbers that were plucked from thin air. One of the numbers I can tell you specifically, $75 million, deals with the health care uh, savings initiative uh, yeah. put forward by the health care uh, committee. Well, in the union document that's been circulated, on page three of it, it explicitly says the health care cost containment committee has failed to control costs. And this is the committee that's supposed to provide $75 million of costs, and yet the unions themselves are saying it's failed to do so. So it's a highly dubious saving. I wouldn't bet uh, Connecticut's future on savings like that. All right. All right. Well, we know you have a tough job and uh, a lot of work ahead of you. We appreciate you taking Thank time. Thank you very much. He is here to talk about his future and the future for Connecticut's GOP. His future and the future for Connecticut's GOP. He is here to talk about his future.